from me. It's not recorded. Um, if you have an issue during the session, equally if you have a question as well, uh, please use the chat function. It's not interrupt the speakers. We love the chat uh, coming through, so keep it coming. Uh, and so, like we've been talking about, let us know what you're drinking. Like I mentioned, I have a lovely tea here. But I have burnt my mouth, so lucky I was. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing my files. Um, first up, we have Christy Van Hoven, who's calling all the way from Canada, which is bonkers and brilliant. Um, Christy, if you want to um, just get into the habit of sharing your screen and getting ready to turn your camera and your mic on, that'd be great. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction whilst we do that. Um, so Christy Van Hoven is in her post field work and writing up stage. Uh, she's a current PhD researcher studying the effects museum experiences have on community and individual healing and well-being. As the director of the National EMS Museum in the USA, she worked closely with first responders to create environments and experiences to help navigate the traumas in the field and to support recovery and resilience through programs and exhibitions while honouring honoring the legacy of those who give their lives to save others. Brilliant stuff. Uh, so yeah, Christy, get yourself comfortable and whenever you're ready, uh, take it away. All right, famous last words. I forgot to turn stuff on before I shared screen. Uh, okay, let's see if I can get this all working again. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you are not nearly as sweaty as I am here. It's about 40 degrees and just breaking the noon hour, so we have a long, hot day ahead of us. Um, all right, here we go, maybe. Okay, um, so thank you, Kelly, for the wonderful introduction. And as mentioned, um, I am researching the healing power of museums and how museums can help support um, well-being within their communities and um, other areas where museum collections, museum galleries, the space itself, um, and the staff can support us um, through recovery and reency. So um, the healing power. Here we go. Uh, one of my favorite quotes that has been driving my research um, well before I even started research um, is this great one um, from one of our favorites in the museum field. Um, and it, it really speaks to the role museums can play mentally um, within our communities, both as community entities and um, us individually. So we're all here. We all think we know what museums are, um, but do we really know what museums are? Um, we can think of, you know, they're big, they're small, they bring people together, um, they have lots of different stuff. Some specialize in areas um, historically, scientifically. Um, maybe you think of tours, maybe you think of events. Um, but definitely we all think of collections, that there's something in which this entity exists around um, and drives the museum in its work. But if we take a step back, if we take the collections out of the museum, and let's all take a moment to gasp that I suggested we take the collections out of the museum, um, what are museums really? So for me, and the research I'm doing, museums aren't collections. Museums are empty shelves where people can come together and um, they can experience things and they can um, form their own sets of communities with potentially people or things, um, experiences that they wouldn't normally interact with as they uh, go about their daily lives. So museums really become a new community and a new community hub um, and they have a lifeblood of their own. So they're living and breathing and they can contribute to a discourse, they can contribute to health and wellness. Um, so collections are just a very small part of what museums are in my world. For me, my first museum job was at a historic site. Um, so these are quick snapshots of where I've been and where I'm going. Um, at the historic site, my job was primarily program um, management, development, um, really bringing kids into the past and exciting them and teaching them how to learn and grow from past experiences in our community. Um, I then moved to a hospital uh, where I 
managed a hospital museum, and that's where I first started to truly encounter patients, although I had at the historic site because we did a number of um, medical-based programs, history of medicine programs, but then I moved into a hospital and I saw the effects that um, medical journeys, uh, illness, wellness and that transition um, had on people and they used the museum uh, as a place to recover, to process, to um, experience therapeutic energy. Um, so museums took on a whole different meaning for me in the hospital. My last big jump, I've had a couple of career changes between the hospital and now, but my last big jump is moved into the directorship of the National EMS Museum. So EMS in the in North America is the emergency medical services. It's paramedics, um, first responders, EMTs. Uh, there's lots of names for it, but essentially pre-hospital care. And these are the people that see the worst of the worst people at their worst. And um, as we probably all know, it, that takes a toll too. So um, we're really discovering what resiliency looks like and how museums can um, help support resiliency within that community. So jumping gears, um, we think about health and recovery and wellness and our journeys towards that. Um, there's areas that museums can definitely participate in. Um, lots of us have hands-on collections, whether we're a hands-on museum or not. Um, there is space in which we can exist and we can participate in history and science and art, um, so that hands-on thing, we're starting to appeal to all of our senses. Um, importantly, especially in trauma and brain health, um, there's storytelling, there's recovery or uh, recall management, um, physical therapy, learning how to redo stuff, um, whether it's relearn how to walk relearn how to tie your shoes, um, relearn words and how to express yourself. That can all happen within a museum setting. Um, that leads into recovery and resiliency. So recovery from any sort of procedure, from um, a trauma, from um, just a minor illness, even a cold or a flu, just reintegrating yourself into a community after a prolonged illness. Museums are a great place to do that because they're generally open um, and can you can take stuff at your own pace. You don't have to jump like right back into a classroom or right back into work. You can kind of stroll your way through. Resiliency um, is your ability to continue after a traumatic event or after um, an experience that has altered the way um, you're going to perceive your future. And so museums uh, give you that processing place to form um, a resiliency plan. And then, of course, um, medical training um, can take place within a museum wall, and I'm sure everybody is raising an eyebrow to that. Um, but both for community and for medical professionals, a museum offers a really great alternative to clinical training. Um, so it teaches observational skills, it teaches um, how to be mindful of your distractions and to work past them, especially um, if any of you have worked with uh, massive amounts of field trips in one building, <laughs> you know how distracting they can be. Um, so there's lots of little nuanced skills um, that can come out as part of a training program um, for first responders, police, fire, EMS, um, as well as physicians, nurses, clinicians, um, physician assistants, and whatnot, um, as well as a number of other fields. I just, I specialize with the medical profession, so um, those are my examples. So my current research um, has taken me in kind of weird directions. It started out as um, mental health and trauma recovery, so working with those who had concussions and um, brain trauma and long-term brain illness, so dementia, Alzheimer's, um, and things on those natures, uh, but uh, it sharply turned into something a little more general. So here's what I've learned through my research, through the fieldwork, um, and now in my writing up stage. The first thing we've learned, um, and this is a very broad stroke, that museums provide shelter. So they are generally speaking a safe place, a building, a sound building within our communities um, that everybody generally knows where it is how to get in. Um, you may not know hours. There may be um, 
feelings of unwelcomeness, but generally it's an imposing structure somewhere within your community that you know um, where it is. So like a fire station, like a police station, museums provide that same type of presence to their communities. Um, it's usually full of kids and families, so it's not exclusive in the sense that um, it's a club where you need to um, know the right person to get in um, and multi-generations end up going and occupying the same space. Museums are also our community historians and they provide community services um, and collect community stories. So generally, and I'm, I'm more on the historian side, so I'm not speaking as much about art or science museums, although they do the same thing, uh, museums preserve our history and our stories. Um, now there's the big shift towards collecting stories that may not be um, as celebratory as uh, they have been in the past, so collecting those challenging stories and those challenging um, artifacts that help rewrite the narrative to a more inclusive, um, even if it's not a positive, but a more inclusive story for the community. Um, we're also seeing museums become more community-centric, so those that may have been more encyclopedic in the past um, and more authoritarian are now um, turning more towards their community, towards advisory uh, council and committees to help become more inclusive in the way they present their artifacts, their narrative, um, the science and art. Um, oops, it fits. Uh, museums are partners in things, so museums don't have to stand alone anymore, um, nor should they. So they can work with community partners. In my case, a lot of them uh, partnerships are with Alzheimer's societies, um, other wellness societies, uh, autism awareness, um, schools uh, that specialize in certain um, students and student training, um, educational resources as well as working closely with um, medical professional societies. So um, if you're not aware, there are professional colleges and societies for just about every specialty in medicine um, and every specialty in medicine. So you end up with this very large group of um, diverse uh, opportunities to collaborate on um, things that the community may need. So um, one thing that's come up throughout research, and it's more prevalent in the UK than it is over here, um, but wellness habits and um, turning towards um, drug abuse uh, partnerships, so with uh, groups that try to prevent um, drug overdose or um, who raise awareness uh, around smoking or drinking, um, museums can provide that community outlet uh, for them to get their message out. And then, of course, we kind of talk about training health professionals and what um, museums can offer there as far as educational resources. Um, so not only a history of medicine collections, but also providing a space and a curriculum um, in which training specialists can come in and practice their skills or learn some new skills. Currently, at my job, um, I'm working on two very unique projects for North America. One of them is um, resiliency training for first responders. So here is a picture of a world-renowned artist that we're working with, Daniel Sundell, who's a firefighter, paramedic, but also a photographer. And part of his PTSD, his trauma recovery plan, is to create art. Um, and when he started that journey, um, he was on the brink of some very bad um, mental health conditions. And through his art creation, um, he started to feel better, but still felt that something was missing. And what was missing was his ability to share um, and have a safe place to help process the story the images, the experiences that he had as a first responder. Um, art wasn't cutting it, but art was the medium through which the goal was going to be accomplished. So what we do is we curate exhibits, um, and we're going to start ramping that up, that um, brings first responder art together. So we have a couple of cartoonists, um, Daniel, a photographer, who then reworks it into an artistic, uh, photographs into artistic um, 
presentations and then true painting uh, drawing artists as well that are um, working through their own personal trauma but coming together and sharing their story of resiliency um, with the public. And our first presentation actually brought together um, nurses, teachers, firefighters, um, and museum professionals into a discussion about what trauma is and how resiliency can be experienced, um, both trauma and resiliency can be experienced by all professions. And it was very interesting to sit back and to see um, these people have exactly the same experiences, um, walk away with the same emotions, whether it was a classroom experience, um, a first responder experience, or an in clinical hospital experience, um, or a museum experience. So um, definitely it's able to bring people together in a unique way um, and help understand kind of some mental baggage that, or emotional baggage that everybody may be carrying. Um, and that group, uh, created lifelong friends just discussing resiliency um, and processing trauma together. So that was very cool. The other thing um, that I've researched um, and we haven't quite put it into practice yet is how um, museums can help reimagine the story. So it, your story becomes our story. It's no longer the museum's story, but it's our community's story. Um, and that's one thing we work at at the EMS Museum. One of the best projects I came across during research um, was out of the Minneapolis Institute of Art um, four years ago, nearly to the day, a Minneapolis police officer shot and killed um, a very active community member who was black, um, who had disclosed that he had a gun in the vehicle, um, which you're allowed to do in Minneapolis, um, but the officer felt unsafe knowing that um, and fired and um, ultimately killed this man. The Art Institute, located very close to where it happened within the community, um, decided that they were going to open their doors and they were going to have a community curated event in honor of this man's life. Um, and that became a special collection and a special exhibition. And what came out of that was um, community resiliency that I think we've seen through the latest issues um, in Minneapolis uh, with police violence. and um, it's marked itself as a safe space and the community has since respected that area um, and it's not been um, affected by the riots and the, the looting that had happened um, last month in Minneapolis. Um, so that's kind of a, an interesting way for museums to secure position within their community. Um, so well aware that I need to talk faster Here's our future um, of healthcare um, healing powers of museums. So we're all living in COVID times and we're never going to go back to normal. Our, our perception of the world has now changed indefinitely. Um, so digital programs are here to stay um, and being able to curate digitally and present um, essentially pandemic safe programs is definitely one thing that museums are going to step up and start doing. Um, Museums are going to, or curators, somebody on the museum staff is going to move into a hair, a healthcare team member. Um, so whether that's in clinic, hospital practice, which I did, hospital being part of a care team, whether it's patient advocacy, um, just a helping hand, um, somebody to be a mental um, advocate for a patient, um, those, those things all have a potential to work from a museum standpoint. Um, I'm also working with our first responders in being a field response, uh, uh, part of the field response crisis team. So after a hurricane goes through, after a tornado goes through, um, trying to think of other things that happen in Europe that <laughs> um, would lead to a mass uh, critical response, um, people flock for the first 24 to 48 hours after a crisis and then the world becomes a ghost town and people are living in pop-up shelters. People are um, with basic, sometimes basic necessities, so food and water, um, but maybe nothing else. And there's no place to go to work. There's no connection um, to the world through computer because the um, communication systems are down. Museums are primed to do out, 
outreach programs there and to help people process their grief and their trauma um, through pop-up exhibitions as part of a critical response team. So um, we're working on a framework right now as the EMS Museum to uh, instigate that into um, Red Cross critical response as well as um, private critical response teams that exist in North America. So um, the future is going to be very exciting and a lot more active partnerships for museums. So no longer are we the temple of the muses, but we are going to be community partners living and breathing within um, those around us. So that is it. Um, quick and dirty contact me if you're in North America. Uh, also happy to chat, but um, I know a phone call from Lester is very expensive. So um, keep your uh, emails coming. Um, Twitter, of course, you can find me in the um, Facebook group as well for University of Leicester. So uh, I look forward to questions once we're done with the other two presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so much of that content is on trend at the moment. It's crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, guys, if you have um, any questions or anything, then get them in the chat and we'll come to them after all speakers are done. And then Christy, if you want to yeah, get your camera off and the mic off. Perfect. Awesome. So Julie, if you want to start getting your, your microphone on, that would be great. Um, I'm sharing your slides, but I need to sort that. Um, can you see me okay? I can see you wonderfully, yeah. Um, cool. So I'm just going to give you a little introduction. Um, so Julia Has White House is from the UK. She's called from the UK and she's in her second year, a uh, part-time student of her PhD. Following a career in policy development in the public sector, Julie undertook a placement with voluntary services overseas at the Kingali Genocide Memorial in Rwanda. On her return, she went back to university to complete a master's degree in global development at the University of Leeds, focusing on gender, conflict and Africa. She then spent 10 years working for non-government organisations, organizations, NGOs, uh, as a funding advisor and programme manager, including co coordination of a strategic grant from the UK's National Lottery, working with organisations of people living with HIV and AIDS in southern Africa. For the past five years, she was the business manager of a local charity supporting women who experience sexual violence in childhood. Her academic interests are gender and genocide, oral history and sexual violence. So yeah, Julie, when you're ready, I'm going to turn my camera and my mic off. So just uh, feel free to start. Thanks, Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Hurst Whitehouse and today I'm going to present a paper called The Holocaust Paradigm in Oral History from Other Genocides and give some early reflections. In 1992, the theorist Hayden White wrote a book chapter called Historical Implotments and the Problem of Truth. In it, he draws parallels between academic historical writing and literature noting how the genre of history can borrow heavily from the genre of literature. This has inspired me to think about, as he puts it, the story behind how the story came to be told in relation to oral history. In my thesis, this means questioning who is allowed to tell their stories, how the characters are portrayed and how the story unfolds. Next slide, please. Thank you. By comparing methodology and analysing testimony from three oral history collections of genocide and mass atrocities, my research will ask how women negotiate the complex societal narratives around sexual violence to make their experiences audible. I have reviewed literature on Holocaust oral history theory and practice, in particular texts that have analysed the major Holocaust oral history collections in the English speaking world. I've started to ask questions about the history of knowledge production and how the Holocaust paradigm might influence the development of oral history collections on other genocides. This means asking whether Holocaust oral history protocols and procedures are appropriate to other genocides. And what oral history methodology and practice exists within non-government organisations who work with survivors 
of the Rwandan genocide, which I will be focusing on today. Today I will give some early reflections on the symbiotic links between the University of Southern California's Visual History Archive, which I'll refer to as the Showa Archive, and the Oral History Collection managed by the Aegis Trust in Rwanda, one of my partner organisations. I will do this by using testimonial accounts from three Rwandan women. Next slide, please. The Shower Archive was set up in 1994 by Steven Spielberg and is the big action of Holocaust and genocide oral history in the world with nearly 55,000 interviews held there. The archive was cre created to preserve memories of the Holocaust as a research and educational tool. Following the relocation of the archive within the um, within the University of South Southern California in 2006, the organisation began to expand its remit and now acts as a repository for oral history collections from other genocides and mass atrocities. As part of this work, it acts in a capacity building role for partner organisation and critically for this presentation, this is included training staff from par partner agencies on SHOA archive methods, techniques and protocols for capturing testimony. Four staff from the Aegis Trust Rwanda underwent a training internship at the Shoa Archive in 2011. Next slide please. This slide is a crude visual re representation as the Shoa Archive as, a as an umbrella rep repository. Out of the 55,000 testimonies within the archive, 54,141 relate to the Holocaust. Only 117 relate to the Rwandan genocide, with 19, 99 sorry, of these emanating from the Aegis Trust Rwanda and 17 are part of the Shoah collection directly. Next slide please, Kelly. In his book, Reframing Holocaust Testimony, Noah Schenker explores the framing conditions of the Shoah archive and their operational protocols. He finds that the three-part life story approach is implemented with clear boundaries. This slide illustrates what the ideal interview should consist of according to Shoah protocols with 20% of the narrative should be spent on life before the genocide, 60% of the narrator's experience during the genocide, and 20% on life after the genocide. There is a tendency for some aspects of everyday life during the pre-genocide period to be idealised. In the closing remarks, the narrator is offered the chance to leave a message for the future, often with young people in mind and dovetailing into the educational aspects and aims of the organisation. So how does this life story approach play out in action? Next slide, please. This is Evelyn and she was interviewed in 2008 by Aegis Trust staff on behalf of the Shoah Ar Archive. Her interview is therefore part of the Shoah Archive's direct collection. The interview took place 14 years after the genocide in Rwanda. It is in Kinyawanda with English sub subtitles as are all the, of the examples today. Evelyn's testimony is an example of the Holocaust oral history paradigm in action, clearly conforming to the Shoah Archive protocol for a segmented life story interview. The interviewer makes this clear in his in introduction. We are going to listen to the testimony of Bankoyinde Evelyn. She will tell us about her life before the genocide, during the genocide, as well as her life after the genocide, he says. Efforts are made to steer her memories in a chronological order, fact check what she says and try to create an idealised view of Evelyn's everyday pre-genocide life. 
This is indicative of the Shoah Archive's preference for structuring memories and narrative patterns. Fact checking is carried out for historical preservation and counteract both genocide deniers and those skeptical of oral history as a, reli as a reliable source. But the fascinating part of the interview is in the Sorry, the fascinating part of the interview is in the final part of the testimony when Evelyn strongly resists the attempts to portray her personal aspirations for the future. Four times the interviewer asks her about her hopes for the future and while she does articulate that she wants her surviving children to have a good education, twice she says, for me there is no hope. Finally, she shows some frustration with the persistent line of questioning and turns the question on the interviewer. But what do you think? Evelyn asks. How can I have hope? I can't have any. Of course, they mock us. However, when asked if she wants to add anything to our interview, Evelyn then gives a solid and positive message to young people. I want you, the youth, to remember what we went through and be brave enough to fight against that, she says. So while the structure and final positive message of Evelyn's testimony complies with the Shoah blueprint, in its content, Evelyn shows defiance at attempts to shape her words into a particular narrative form. I've added some additional quotes to each of the slides um, from each of the Rwandan women whose um, testimony that I have sampled just to give you a flavour of what they said, of what they say. Next slide please Kelly. I'd now like to introduce you to Rose who was interviewed by staff of the Egypt Trust Rowan in 2011. In this interview a life story approach is again clear from the outset and detailed fact checking of names and places where events occurred. Much longer is spent on Rose's pre-genocide experience. This creates a deeper sense of Rose's professional life and her family life as leaders in the community. In her answers, Rose places emphasis on anti-Tutsi prejudice that her siblings experienced. But she expresses her agency from the outset about herself and her role in the family, both pre and post-genocide. Another thing that I remember about myself, which still drives me, my father would always tell me to be bold. He made me head of the family. Now that I'm a widow, I'm still brave and will always be brave. In 1990, Rose was kidnapped and raped by Hutu and was then forced to marry him by the Tutsi community who feared reprisal if she didn't. The pain that she experienced because of this is evident in her testimony. An area of tension occurs following this part of her interview, during which the interviewer attempts to get Rose to talk about fem memories of her husband and children and the, quote, the good times that you had. In a composed manner, Rose politely replies that, my husband, Mabaza Matina, innocent, I think you, I think I told you how we married by him raping me first. We lived together in harmony and gave birth to the firstborn and he was proud of it. In this moment, Rose rejects the narrative pattern of the interview that attempts to shape her family life in one dimensional terms. Instead, she expresses that her married life and her children cannot be extrapolated from its violent beginnings. Next slide, please. My final example is Phoebe, again in interviewed by staff of the Egypt Trust Rwanda in 2011. Phoebe is part of a subgroup of Tutsi called the Bagogwe who reside in the north of Rwanda. In 1991, the area was caught up in conflict between the Rwandan government and the Rwandan Patriotic Front, a rebel army at the time. Many Bagogwe Tutsi were arrested, raped and murdered in an area called Bigogwe. It is clear from the outset that Phoebe's story is interest to the Aegis Trust for a particular reason. 
Rather than asking her to talk in sections about the genocide, at the beginning of the interview, thanks Phoebe for talking to him about the history of the genocide and, quote, especially what happened in Bigogwe. Most of the testimony therefore focuses on this period. Phoebe talks candidly about rape from the beginning, both her own experience and the women she knew. On the impact of being the only surviving female sibling and looking after orphan children, she says, I was physically and mentally disabled. I contracted the HIV virus and I raised so many children whom I didn't give birth to because I was not married. As a result of these consequences of the genocide, I raised the children, but I don't know what giving birth is like. This interview does not follow the life story fo format and there is no attempt from the interviewer to form Phoebe's testimony into a chronological order. Her, her narrative is therefore much more fragmented, flowing ma in many directions and punctuated by facts. In this testimony, the life story protocol seems to have been abandoned. Phoebe delivers a monologue and speaks about rape, including her own from the beginning. The impact of the genocide on her gendered identity is prominent, prominent in her narration and she steers the direction of her interview through a compelling, almost non-stop account. Next slide, please. I cannot do justice to the witness testimony I've presented here today. Instead, I offer some initial reflections on a small sample. We have seen that Evelyn and Rosie's testimony follow the structure of the three-part life story interview, though it has been applied to different extents. This results in clear segments in which they talk about life during, before, during and after the genocide, but there are tensions in both interviews. Evelyn stubbornly refuses to voice any hope for her own future and challenges the interviewer on this question. Rose reminds the interviewer that her married life was rooted in sexual violence. Phoebe's testimony is allowed to free flow so her memories weave through time periods during which she tries to piece together events that were both illogical and horrific. In these examples, all narrators demonstrate ag agency during their interviews by resisting interviewer attempts to mould their experiences in particular into particular sites or formats by reminding the interviewer of the reality of their lived experience, by steering the direction and pace of, pace of the interview. These are some of the ways that the examples demonstrate compliance to and deviation from the blueprint or paradigm of the Shoah archive. I look forward to your comments and the next stage of my research. Next slide, please. Um, there's my references and contact details. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Fab stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, get your questions in the chat if you have some while well, I'm just waiting for my video to come on. <laughs> oh, there it is. Perfect. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, yeah, if you want to just turn your mic and your camera off and then I will stop sharing the slides. Great stuff. Well done, speakers. Um, there we go. And then Suchi, yeah, if you want to start getting ready with your mic, not your camera, but your screen, uh, that would be great. Uh, awesome. Cool. Fab. I'm just going to give you a quick introduction. So everyone, this is Suchi. Uh, she's recently completed her probation review and is a second year PhD student in the Department of Informatics. Her doctoral research investigates the use of blockchain technology for managing cloud services. She has worked as a visiting lecturer at the University of Hertfordshire since 2015 and is an Associate Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. So yeah, over to you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, the presentations were by Christy and uh, Judy were really interesting. Um, Christy mentioned community curation, which is uh, relevant to my research as well, although in a, uh, in a very different context. So uh, the focus of my research is uh, commissioning cloud services through decentralized blockchain-based smart contracts. 
So, um, oh, sorry, I should start presenting it. So, um, so what I am examining is the potential benefits of using blockchain to enable a decentralized marketplace for cloud application services. Um, and uh, this is governed by blockchain smart acts. Um, you may be familiar with blockchain as uh, the record keeping technology behind Bitcoin network. Um, you may also have come across uh, its definition as a distributed decentralized public ledger. Uh, at its most basic level, blockchain is literally digital information or rec records, um, which is the block stored in a public database or, or the chain. Um, so the blockchain database is a ledger or list where transactions are recorded once and cannot be easily changed. So this immutity is based on a cryptographic protocol uh, that is a hash function that protects the sequence of uh, linked blocks or, rec or rec of records. Uh, the, uh, the ledger database is uh, described as being distributed. Um, and this is because it is replicated or shared across users or nodes connected in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network and is not owned or fully controlled controlled by a single entity. This decentralization is the core principle of blockchain, which relates to um, absence of a central authority governing exchange or sharing of information, data, or assets between participants. Um, instead, peers in a network collectively control uh, transaction mediation and decision making. Um, an important characteristic of blockchain systems is consensus, which allows participants to know that transactions have been executed and to also evaluate the trustworthiness of such transactions. Um, coming to smart contracts, uh, an important milestone in the development of blockchain technology was implementation of small computer programs called smart contracts. Uh, I am conscious of the time, but I do have a question. Have any of you used a system driven, driven by a smart contract? Kelly, I think I need your help in case there um, is any response because I can't see the chat box. Um, I won't wait for long, of course, but Sorry, yeah, that was me. My audio was taking a little while to uh, come on then. Uh, no, everyone's, I think we're a consensus of a no. So yeah, carry on. Let's okay, make okay, no problem. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you all of you who have responded. Uh, well, the concept of smart contract is not new and we have come across it in everyday life. Uh, a more primitive form of a smart contract is an automatic vending machine, which I'm sure all of you have uh, used. Um, and this operates on a set of rules for transaction programmed into it to dispense of only if enough money has been uh, inserted or ejecting change, etc. So smart contracts in the context of blockchain work on similar principles, but what blockchain enables is transparency and verifiability of these rules and the transactions they enable. So this is um, what it is. A smart contract uh, is a self-enforcing agreement formalized as software or a block of code built into the blockchain to, fac to facilitate, verify, or negotiate transactions. Um, it operates under a set of conditions. And when those conditions are met, the terms of the agreement are automatically um, executed. The software code embeds business logic uh, and a set of predefined rules governing participant interactions. And this is, of course, entirely peer to peer without needing trusted intermediaries. Uh, essentially, it has given blockchain the ability to implement a varied set of business functions involving the transfer of information or value while leaving uh, transparent and reliably aud uh, auditable information trails. So um, 
why am I researching this? Um, cloud computing, um, as you may know already, is a catch-all term for anything that delivers on-demand services over the internet. Um, and uh, common uses uh, uh, of this are um, file storage, for example, Dropbox, um, which we often use, uh, on-demand de streaming, Netflix, which I have been using a lot with my daughter during this lockdown, um, email, uh, for example, Gmail or Outlook, etc. Um, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong slide. Uh, yes, so this um, is what I intended to share. Um, so this is the three models of uh, for cloud computing services, which can be distinguished as uh, starting from the lowest tier of the sta uh, stack, infrastructure, uh, platform, and software or applications, each providing a set of resources or services that can be traded as commodities. I'm not going to go into the details about these tiers, but my research concerns the services and capabilities of the upper two tiers, that is platform as a service and software as a service, um, that are relevant to cloud native application development. Um, this can be a um, service like a cloud database, which belongs in the past year, or a cognitive service like text translator, which is a software as a service. Uh, one of the main considerations in cloud native application architecture is designing business applications as a collection of loosely coupled component cloud services sourced from multiple providers. However, a significant impediment to this is uh, the lack is, uh, of access to a global market of services that provides choice and competitive prices for cloud application developers. Um, presently, there is an underlying threat of centralization and market dominance by major organizations like um, Azure, uh, Microsoft, um, Google, and Amazon. Um, and this is further compounded by provider-specific uh, service implementations and uh, quality of service guarantees, which creates dependency and lock-in to service providers. Um, so these factors make it difficult for developers and consumers to find services which are compatible with the needs of their applications or to even switch providers if needed. Um, the cloud space has seen considerable efforts to, to, uh, <laughs> to address uh, sorry, this, these issues uh, through use of centralized electronic agents or brokers. However, um, what has been found is that it creates reliance on a single or a, so or a small group of entities with the potential of shifting the lock-in to, to these uh, intermediaries. Uh, and this is where the relevance of blockchain uh, springs into prominence. Um, as, um, as it can um, enable management and commissioning of cloud services in a decentralized marketplace implemented as a set of smart contracts. The benefits that blockchain can bring based on its uh, fundamental properties that I have discussed before are uh, firstly decentralization. Um, uh, so instead of relying on a central authority to intermediate as a broker, consumers and sellers can interact directly in a decentralized network for negotiating and consuming cloud services. The rules of the smart contract can streamline and automate the transaction processes based on majority uh, consensus of network of participants. The next benefit is immutability, which um, that is the transactions can be committed to the ledger as permanent authoritative records uh, to be accessed by all participants. And this is tamper resistant and makes it computationally infeasible for any actor to delete or amend the history. Um, the third benefit is transparency. Um, that is the consensus based transactions are fully traceable and the underlying rules of a smart contract are verifiable by participants, uh, and this ensures trust. The overall aim is to connect cloud application service providers with service consumers in a decentralized market network and enable them to select, contract, and switch between 
proprietary cloud services through trusted transactions on the blockchain. Um, the proposed marketplace solution for commissioning cloud services will be implemented as a token curated registry or TCR, which essentially is, is a smart contract pattern or protocol to realize a decentralized registry or list. This is uh, similar to solutions like TripAdvisor, which provides ranked lists of items, hotels, etc. However, uh, these lists are maintained by a central entity that can add or remove entries at their discretion, and they are also prone to manipulation. So TCRs address um, some of the issues of non-transparent centralized list management by employing wisdom of the crowd or community-based decentralized curation. Participants can collectively vote uh, for an entry they strongly believe belong on the list. In the cloud scen scenario, the benefit is that it, this can address the, uh, the issues of bias or, um, or dominance of major players. TCRs involve, uh, involves a, involve a crypto economic incentive mechanism tied around a native token or a digital currency which is used to determine voting rights proportional to a stake in terms of tokens used for voting and also to provide incentives for um, curation to the curators at the end of every voting cycle. The protocol of the TCR is underpinned by smart contracts um, that automate the rules governing its processes, such as uh, listing applications, recording votes, automating reward distribution based on outcomes and ranking entries. Uh, smart contracts make these key processes more transparent and fair uh, relative to centralized registries and therefore increase trustworthiness and value of lists. Um, quick example um, here, the, the protocol goal uh, is to create and maintain trusted and useful lists that provide a reliable signal of uh, quality of entries, uh, which in uh, my case is cloud services. Um, so looking at this diagram, uh, consumers or end users uh, utilize the list based on their, sorry, um, Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, we have to start with the candidates. So the candidate cloud service providers have to propose uh, first an entry for a specific li list by staking a token. Um, and being on, on a list is validation of quality of their efforts and also a way to communicate that they are following market standards. A network of decentralized curators can then participate in voting on acceptance or rejection of an application, also by staking tokens. They are expected to curate using expertise or good judgment to maintain quality of lists and earn, uh, uh, incentives or rewards for honest curation. The default option is rejection of an application in order to keep the quality of lists high. Um, in addition, curators can also challenge an existing um, whitelisted uh, entry in the event that the quality of, of the service or um, item um, degrades to the extent that it fails to meet the requirements of the registry. So an, an, um, an entry that is accepted or rejected um, is, is this is this the, the decision is based on a majority consensus of curators. And once it is accepted, it is lodged in, in the relevant list. Uh, or a data store, and um, the transaction is recorded on blockchain uh, in, in a secure and encrypted form. The coordination can be handled by smart contracts, recording and aggregating votes, and automating incentive distribution in tokens tokens to curators in the majority block. So this uh, basic flow uh, represents the concepts of community-driven curation of high quality and trusted lists of off-chain uh, cloud services that are useful to consumers who need um, high quality uh, offers. The mechanism um, is driven by self-enforcing code and well-designed in incentives to ensure a self-sustaining registry that works without centralized 
invention, intervention. Um, I'm currently designing uh, this uh, TCR protocol. Um, thank you for your time. If you have any comments or questions, please do send me an email to the address that you can see on the screen. Hi guys, sorry my audio is having a whale of a time but not working. Um, thank you so much, CG. That was brilliant, and oh, that technology that you're using is beautiful. I love it. Um, so yeah, guys, that's all the speakers that are done. So if you've got any chats, and feed them through the the chat function. Any questions, feed them through the chat function as now. Um, thank you to all our speakers. It's um, it's it's very like. You should be very proud of what you've done. It's not easy uh, kind of talking to people uh, about your research anyway, let alone in the environment that we're in. So yeah, please do be very proud of what you did. Um, I really love this event because um, you get to hear from researchers at all different levels. Um, and that makes me very proud to be able to do the job that I do. Um, and you learn so much, um, it, including the thing about Steven Spielberg being involved in uh, Judy's research. Uh, crazy, crazy stuff. Um, if anybody else is listening and they want to have a go at Cafe Research, then by all means, let us know. Uh, we can always get you involved. Like you've seen today, it's just short presentations, very informal about your research, just chatting to other researchers um, and sharing content. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a safe environment for you to give it a go. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to take a look at the chat function. Um, just wanted to give Neil a bit of a shout out. I hope your kitchen table is all clear now. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, look. Great talk to everyone. Right, so we have a question for uh, Christy, if you want to come online and get your camera on. Uh, hopefully you're still with us. <laughs> um, so it's the, the question, if you can see it in the chat as well. Are you still here? Yeah, you are. <laughs> Just want um, to get on. <laughs> It takes its time, doesn't it? So yeah, you can probably see it as well, but I'll just read it out. Uh, so Neil says, it was great to hear about such positive work going on in museums, especially to do with health and recovery. I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, he says, I never really thought um, about museums in that way, despite visiting many devoted to natural history and research on fossils in their collections. And their collections. Um, what do you think the biggest challenges are to museums in adopting similar schemes and projects? Are they the most effective in local and regional museums that might be more connected with the community or can larger national museums also play a useful role? Interested. Yes. Do you want to shout out? Um, yes. My caveat being I could probably talk for hours, so cut me off when <laughs> everybody's falling asleep. Um, just type C's in the chat box and I'll stop talking. Um, yes. So um, really interesting kind of thoughts around this um, is that any museum can participate. If there's somebody who sees a benefit, of course. It doesn't need to be a small museum. Um, large museums can certainly do it. Having worked for both small community museums and large museums, um, a lot of bureaucracy in large museums. And it um, is like turning the Titanic around, and we know how that turned out. Um, so the challenges exist within uh, organizational structure, I think, more than anything else. Um, and that's not just within the museum organizational structure, but within the community organizational structure, too. So if we think of, um, I know this is being recorded, but don't, re <laughs> don't quote this. If we think about, um, the British Museum and its role within its community, both, um, you know, right within its physical location and the people that live around it. That's one community. It's part of the UK community or the English community and then the UK community. And it's actually, you know, a world renowned museum. So um, can it participate in global wellness? Of course it can participate in global wellness. And it might be better, easier for that museum to address it on a scale. Um, something the Smithsonian does, um, although they're slow to advertise and implement, is they have community wellness 
programs, not quite in the same way I was speaking on them, um, but they collect community history because they have satellite sites within various communities. So you can almost think of um, the Tate being an equivalent in how the Tate has moved into smaller communities um, or the IWM has moved into smaller communities um, to kind of share their narrative and their, their collections um, in a more satellite way. Anyway, the Smithsonian is a huge institution, 12 museums in Washington, D.C., plus satellite sites across the U.S., um, and those satellite community sites are preserving community history, especially um, as I was speaking about the Minneapolis Project. Similar thing happening at a, a national level with the Smithsonian, um, especially now with the Black Lives Matter movement um, and the examination into first responders, um, response to crisis. Uh, so those are, are two big areas that are part of a national collecting scope and I think will translate into um, community wellness programs once we're past the crisis point um, in our particular social movements at the moment. Um, another big area of collection anyway globally is COVID response. So how do people respond? How are medical professionals responding? So this big pandemic has opened up a whole new way of thinking about collecting for museums. Um, and then of course that will change into programming and interpretation once we get past our initial pandemic crisis. Um, so yeah, it doesn't need to be a small museum. Small museums are far more agile despite not having staff or financial resources. Um, they have a lot more freedom to explore and to make those really tight-knit community collection, uh, connections. But um, with big people or big institutions, there's a brand behind it um, and a trusted resource. So that lends itself as well to making community connections and community. So um, yes, it's fair game for everybody. Uh, you just have to kind of strategize as you would with other outreach programs uh, within the institution and make sure that the hierarchy buys into it. Sounds great. Um, yeah, exciting stuff. Um, if I could go to, I can't see any more questions, but keep them coming if you need to. Um, if I could go to Suchi, it's just a really simple question, but the, um, the example of a vending machine being a smart contract completely blew my mind. Um, do you have any other kind of examples of smart contracts which are in like day-to-day -day life? I'm not sure if you can hear me. We'll give you a couple of seconds anyway, Suchi, if you can. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I, I forgot to switch off my microphone. Oh, okay. Oh, bless you. I didn't realize that you can't hear me. So, um, no, I was saying that um, that's the only example I could think of while um, um, of a vending machine while uh, creating this presentation. And in fact, I, I, this is the first time I'm present, I have presented my research to uh, anyone outside the supervision team. Um, or the examiners. So, um, but if I can think of anything else, I'll send you an email, Kelly. <laughs> please do, please do. Thank you. Um, and then I'm going to go to Julie as well. Um, obviously, uh, take your time coming online. Um, the content uh, that you were speaking about was, you know, really, you know, moving and quite deep. And that, I mean, how do you feel as a researcher when you are reading these kind of things? Do you have to kind of take it with a different approach? I mean, what is that kind of process? Because obviously it's quite hard hitting. That's a really interesting question, actually, because um, I suppose that having worked in Rwanda at the Genocide Memorial Centre there and having worked for a local charity dealing with survivors of childhood sexual abuse, um, to some extent, I think you find a way of emotionally managing it. Um, but that's not to say that it isn't still hard hitting. Of course, it is very hard hitting. 
and actually I want it to be because if it wasn't I wouldn't really care about it you know and I, I feel very passionately about working in this area and hopefully providing some degree of a voice for the women that um, I'm working with or, or researching. Um, I actually did raise at my last supervision meeting the possibility of having some sort of clinical supervision because I know that in my in my working life all the people that I worked with um, at the local charity who were psychotherapists they all get some degree of supervision um, and my supervision team were quite supportive but it's not something that's current that is kind of the run of the mill to be able to provide that so um, I am currently um, exploring that but I think really um, you have to actively manage your own mental health when you're doing subjects like this and that's what I'm trying to do actually Fab. thank you very much for answering that um, I can't see any more questions coming through, um, but you guys were all brilliant and um, provided your contact details, so thank you for that. Um, so yeah, we're going to leave it there. We're going to close the, the event there. Um, oh, hold on. We've had a last minute. <laughs> nice one, Neil. Um, so yeah, no, we can keep it going. We can keep it going as long as possible. Um, anyone that needs to leave the chat or needs to leave the event, then please do. Uh, but Neil's just come in with one for Christy. You can probably see it, but I'll just read it out as well. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how museums previously providing a physical safe space for the community can or are translating this into a virtual safe space given social distance and restrictions that space in place at the moment? Really good question. Yes, um, really good question. So um, I don't know of anybody else um, that's migrated well-being programs digitally. I can tell you what I've done. Um, so this is a case study, but certainly not um, the Bible in which to base your work. Um, so one thing that I've worked through um, for a number of years now, so it's not COVID specific, is um, engaging ICU in um, activities. So one problem with being in the ICU, the critical care units, is that you're isolated um, because you have to be and you want to be, but you're also really bored. So you can only watch cable TV for so long before you're um, running your eyes in the back of your head or you've binged all of Netflix that you can. Uh, so curating digital exhibitions, um, creating programs like this, um, Oftentimes museums host brown bag lunches, so that's an opportunity for curators to present their research. Um, medical professionals also do it, um, so during the lunch hour they come together, present research um, with their colleagues or with visitors or the public. Um, so that can all take place in the uh, virtual sphere. Um, currently, museums are just starting to open worldwide, um, and a lot of them I think are really just almost approaching reopening with all of their energy. Like, what does it mean to tell somebody they have to have a mask at the front door? Um, and so that's where most concerns are right now, is how to protect people safely. Um, the last four months have been really interesting in North America because people have had about 48, 72 hours to switch all the programming to um, virtual programming. Um, and so a lot of people were able to successfully do that, uh, put their curriculums up online, get tours of the gallery online. Um, again, the smaller museums uh, are a lot more nimble with this. They may not have the best resources, um, but there's a lot you can do with a smartphone and Facebook Live. Um, and so if you're interested at all, I would just pick your favorite museums, go look at their Facebook social media channels and see what they've done um, virtually over the last four months to engage the public. And that will continue and I think develop into more targeted audiences um, and more targeted subject matter. So it won't be general anymore, like, oh crap, what do we do? Um, but it'll become a more 
concentrated, deliberate effort by museums of all sizes moving forward. Yeah. Fab. Yeah, I think you're so right. I think we saw that influx within the first kind of few weeks over here of, you know, this gallery has stuff online that you can go and look into. You can take a step into this museum. And it was just really needed in a time of despair, I think. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's this pandemic. I say it's probably one of the best things that have hit the museum field, although I will get um, laughed at for that, um, because it's it's forced the public to realize what the museums can do for them. So um, I presented like 10 years ago about how to do e-volunteering and how to digitally volunteer at museums. It never really took off until the last year. And then the last four months, of course, everybody's like, I'm bored at home with all my kids. They need something to do. What do we do? Um, and so doors have opened wide for museums now. It's our time to shine. Um, so there's a lot of great stuff that's been in the works for five to 10 years and now finally gets to be front and center, which is very cool to see. Yeah, it's nice to take something positive from yeah. a weird time. Still relating. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, thank you again, uh, speakers. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I think we'll end it there. So yeah, take your time to leave in the room. Uh, but I'll be here for another five minutes if anyone's got any questions or anything. But yeah, have a good Absolutely. evening. Thank have a good rest of your day. Thanks, guys.